over the next few decades, the metaverse will become immensely more advanced and integrated in our daily lives. Some people think the metaverse is just a hype. Others believe it to be the greatest evolution of the internet. Together with these sharpest minds in this space, we are going to explore the future of the metaverse. We want to understand the impacts of this new world. And in this show, we will find the answers. Welcome to Metaverse Mentors. So today at Metaverse Mentors, we have Dr. Sana Farid. What a pleasure of having you here, uh, Sana. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you, Samir, for having me. Thank you. And I want to start by applauding for the profound impact that you are making on people in the space by the astounding work of pushing emerging technologies like AR, XR, VR to improve our societal well-being. And of course, not unsurpri unsurprisingly at Metaverse Mentors, we are very interested in learning more about the metaverse and what we have been seeing is that the metaverse is already penetrating different domains like finance, the entertainment industry, the art sector, fashion, but surely also healthcare. And you are a surgeon, an entrepreneur, a futurist, which is quite diverse field. And the question I would like to start with, which really, which I'm really curious about, how do you kind of intertwine those different areas into each other? And actually, last week, I read a book which is called Principles from a famous investor, Ray Dalio. And he referred in his book about an interaction he had with Elon Musk. When he when they when he visited uh, SpaceX and he asked Elon Musk like how did you come with ID how did you come up with the ID to start uh, SpaceX and then he explained that he had uh, received from the PayPal success like 180 million when they sold that and he was figuring out the problem in the world that it would be kind of inefficient if we are growing as a population to inhabit the world permanently so we started to think okay i need to do something there and then he invested 90 million the health of his net worth into spacex to enter this field and then ray dalio asked him but did you have any background with um, rocket science and those underlying domains and he answered that he didn't have any expertise but what's interesting is that after that he completely dominated that field and the same we saw in in uh, with, with, with Tesla in the automobile industry and now he's also involved in Neuralink and why I'm telling this story is because I see a similarity there between this example and what you are doing because you are also intertwining different fields and I have some friends who are also doctors and I know the curriculum and the topics you need to remember are not modest, it's a quite vast area. So my question to you is, A, like I said, how do you intertwine those fields? But also secondly, what is your approach of acquiring and retaining knowledge in those different areas? Well, um, that's an excellent question, Samir, but an even more uh, amazing example that you have there. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm quite stunned for that example that you shared of Elon Musk, but I think one of the biggest drivers for us to do anything is passion. Of course, knowledge, education, your entire environment and your work space does play a significant role. However, if you are pushed to do something, I think passion is going to be a major driver that is going to push you to acquire the knowledge, the skills and gather yourself among the right people. So. For me, um, to start with, I am very uh, very passionate about uh, my job in surgery. And um, I always wanted to learn how to improve the way I work in surgery, how to be able to reach more people, and how to be able to offer better care for them. And at the same time, I was also very passionate about how to improve the way I work with my students. So in general, I um, always explored on ways how to improve the work that I do. So for me, it was very exciting witnessing and living in the age of exponential 
technologies. I wanted to learn how to we can utilize these amazing tools and improve centuries old practices. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about as well, more than excited, I'm curious about the future of technologies like artificial intelligence, extended reality, and what they can do for us to make healthcare more affordable and um, accessible. Okay, I, I get that. I'm also passionate and curious about a lot of things and I really uh, love learning and immersing myself into foreign domains that are not necessarily close to me. But then there is also that component of complexity and vastness of theoretical concepts that you need to master. So perhaps the underlying question, and perhaps I can adopt some tricks or strategies that you are utilizing is, what is your approach to like kind of rapidly, as you said, we are living in an exponential world. So everything changes and alters rapidly. What, what's your approach in acquiring that knowledge fast and to a sufficient depth to yeah, being operating in it? Uh, another uh, excellent question. I think uh, in today's time, we do have tremendous amount of resources and information available. We do have access to more information that any generation have had in the past. It's about us and what do we want to or how do we want to use it. So um, I think uh, by staying focused on what I want to achieve or what I want to learn by staying curious. This is probably how I achieve things. Whenever I'm curious about them, some topic, I would reach out to the resources, whether it's books, whether it's videos, whether it's mentors, and I would be learning from them and keep myself active in the process of learning. I hope that answers your question now. And also apart from gaining um, yes, knowledge, um, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, apart from great gaining knowledge from these resources, I also tend to be practicing myself a lot. So whenever I learn about something uh, new, a new technology or a new platform, I'm eager to have my hands-on practice on it because that is actually what's going to help me understand the in-depth of it. So step by step and just by staying focused and persistence, uh, was I able to be able to learn more than I would uh, learn in the past. Yeah, that absolutely uh, resonates. Uh, th thanks for uh, explaining that. And I completely recognize if you put into practice the knowledge that you acquired, it will retain more easily than when you just read about something and then you let it uh, lay there for a while because then it goes to the background. So pertaining to the metaverse, uh, perhaps, what do you think uh, is the relation with healthcare and what are like the key challenges that you are seeing and have observed there because obviously you are very active in that field and that perhaps will help us to a, br a bridge where we can envision the solutions for those uh, problems. What do you see there, uh, Sana? Okay, uh, that's a very great question, Samir. So there are three components to your question. Let me answer them one by one. So first of all, you asked about the intersection of the metaverse or XR into healthcare. I generally uh, think and do believe and see on daily basis that healthcare is one of the most influenced fields by technologies like artificial intelligence and extended reality and other technologies as well, where the involvement of technology not only improves current procedures, but also creates further avenues for advanced techniques. So. Thanks to technology, healthcare experts now have access to previously unavailable data. Once we have access to more and more data, more and more resources, it helps us to monitor patients uh, remotely, fill patients' charts faster, and optimize diagnosis and treatment timeframes. So just imagine that when tedious clerical tasks are taken over by technology, it allows to enhance the care provider and the patient relationship, directly impacting on the quality of care. So um, immersive technologies are revolutionizing various aspects of the healthcare industry. First, by improving uh, training for all levels, where XR tools provide realistic, 
uh, critical and responsive training scenarios and can be easily accessible remotely and be available at any time for the purpose of learning. Learning in an active, interactive mode helps the learners to gain knowledge, the skills, and confidence a lot better than conventional method. Then, apart from the learning and education uh, part in healthcare, XR is having a major impact on the patient care, greatly advancing uh, the, the quality of care that is being provided. And some amazing examples of using XR in healthcare is using um, virtual reality or augmented reality for patients with burns or patients undergoing dialysis or chemotherapy. And all of these examples are very painful procedures. They, um, as of now, they heavily depend on distraction therapy where you tend to distract patients by TV screens, magazines, or other activities. But teleporting them to another environment which could be a rehabilitation escape, could be an escape to a nature, or could be a visit to any place that they like, does have a significant impact. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions about healthcare or women uh, on the, the quality of care or the results that will be coming out of it. Um, move on to the challenges and the solutions. No, I'm, care I'm carefully listening. Uh, I have plethora of questions, but uh, keep on, keep on going. So in short, um, XR, what I have literally witnessed in my practices, it does not only improve the patient's morale, but to, this, to some extent, you know, when patients are distracted, it has impacted on the amount of pain medications or harmful medications that they would be taking. So we're not here talking just about uh, a fancy or expensive tool that we are, we would be having. Now, when we talk about the implementation of any technology in any field, let's focus um, today on, on healthcare or education. Uh, widely, there has been a term that has been coined to the adaptation of technology in any field. And uh, probably many of the people out there have heard about Amara's law. What is Amara's law? So Amara's law was first um, established by an American tech uh, researchers, researcher who was named Roy Amara. Amara's law states that users' attitude towards new technologies tends to fluctuate. In the beginning of any technology, when the technology is very new, um, very initial stages of development, people tend to have very high expectations. And probably you have been hearing this, that people wanted to do everything in virtual reality or with augmented reality. However, um, what Amara's law states that by the time the technology advances, when um, developers are improving uh, the technology, when hardware is becoming more flexible to use, more uh, cost effective, and just giving us more feature, this is the time when people tend to, you know, sort of lose interest and become somewhat hesitant in this technology. So it's a it's a conflicting scenario that has been there with every uh, single technology and. I think the, where we stand right now is that we're trying to find that sweet spot in Amara's law for virtual and augmented reality or extended reality in general, um, especially in healthcare. Now, coming to your your last uh, question in this uh, in this part about we identified the challenges. Now, what is the solution? I think the solution is by yeah, perhaps one, perhaps we before we dive into the challenge. Yes. Oh, sorry to interject there, uh, Dr. Sen, but perhaps to uh, complete y your uh, your trail of thought, um, to unpack the technologies. I heard AR and uh, VR. So I can imagine that if I am having a VR class and I undergo ch chemotherapy, that by distraction in a meditation kind of virtual world, Perhaps I would, uh, I could be able to reduce the amount of medicine or supplements that I otherwise would be needing. So that is less damage on my uh, body and a more calm treatment as a whole. Secondly, I heard you talking about 
training. So then I would also be thinking kind of perhaps VR simulating, but perhaps also AR where perhaps some heart is uh, being displayed through my glasses and then I can unpack it in a three-dimensional form. Is that uh, an accurate way of imagining what the solutions are or are there other applications just to yeah, g g accurately understand it? Uh, you are absolutely right, Samir. So first of all, about learning, we were heavily depending or exclusively depending on a passive mode of learning where we read and we memorize and we have very little uh, physical practice. When the time comes for physical practice, the reality is that we're practicing physically on either cadavers or on mannequins, which are not responsive. They're not realistic. They don't respond. They don't bleed. The, 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 the response is just not the same. So whatever you do to it is just very artificial compared to when you are facing real life uh, scenarios, when you're facing real life emergencies. So how to sort of bridge the gap between the massive um, amount of information that you have already received from books and texts and lectures, which is just very passive, and the immediate application of critical cases, sometimes emergency cases in real life. This is what immersive technology um, in general provides you. It provides you hands-on learning on real life, real life-like scenarios in a responsive manner. So your avatar in virtual reality can very well bleed, can very well act as a real human because this is how it was programmed and you are able to change the scenarios multiple times as possible. Uh, when we talk about a clinical application, you can imagine a wide range of application that can be applied to patients of various ages and in a complete safe environment. Really interesting, and I think it's a very relevant example that you're illustrating because what you are saying actually is that we are, in fact, not eliminating the theoretical uh, learning completely, but instead of that, we are supplementing the immersive technologies with uh, books by putting the theory into practice because that c could be a misconception that the metaverse or those immersive technologies are eradicating um, everything. So coming from those uh, challenges or solutions, uh, if you will, are there any additional uh, solutions that we should talk about or we should keep in mind when looking at uh, the challenge in healthcare for the coming years? I think in the, I mean, as we progress with time, we have to keep in mind that the technology, whoever is building the technology and working on it, they're already doing their work to make it more um, flexible for use, more uh, wide uh, range of applications will be coming. So I think on our end, if I consider myself as an educator or as a medical practitioner, we should keep that belief in the back of our hand, uh, uh, back of our head, and keep moving forward with implementation, implementing technology with our daily practices. So I think what we need to do as professionals is find ways on implementing or basically open doors for technology to enter into our daily practices be welcoming for any technology, help to understand what are the areas that we can implement it and, you know, start building um, uh, case studies around the same. So I think what we try to do is that in order to um, fasten the process or merge the uh, process of technology in healthcare is to create standards uh, around it, create best practices. And we will only be achieving this if we start doing a smaller scale projects on our own, make mistakes, learn from those mistakes, and then set the standards for future applications to be happening. So we will be learning by doing and setting examples for the future generations to be learning from our mistakes as well. I, I think it's vitally important to develop those standards and I've read that you are actually working on uh, constructing those standards 
as well. And what I am questioning, because healthcare is such a sensitive uh, domain, because actually human lives rely uh, on it. So there is this dichotomy between innovation, which goes very rapidly and are also funded and probably commercially uh, constructed. But simultaneously, we need to be reluctant and very careful by applying the technologies in a right way. How do you uh, see that dichotomy? And yeah, do you agree or don't you see that as a challenge at all? What do you think here? Um, first of all, yes, I agree with what you said. But uh, second of all, I don't see it as a challenge. I see it as a transition that has to happen. Um, the transformation and revolutions has to happen in the healthcare. We are literally, even in today's time, even during the, the massive um, pandemic crisis, we are following centuries old practices. Can you imagine that in the era of fourth industrial revolution, we are still facing areas around the world that are lacking basic quality of care. And when, when in the rest of the world, when we're talking about so much connectivity, so much advanced technology, I think that's a bit sad to be having a number of uh, the population or humans who are still suffering from basic care. So I think this is the gap that we should be focusing about. We will be, as I said, technology experts are already working on technology to help make it better day by day. While I think us as healthcare providers, we should understand, keep ourselves updated about whatever technology is there and understand how we are implementing it to help our job better day by day. Probably we're able to reach one extra patient at a time uh, or in a day, but that's still saving life. So I think it's going to go hand in hand. The, the medical practice, the knowledge that we're gaining, but also the belief and the integration of technology. Yeah, so makes sense. Um, Dr. Sam, what I'm interested in uh, learning about, what it appears to me is that the metaverse is used in a whole bunch of different uh, situations, but also industries. For example, with technologies like virtual reality, augmented reality, XR, but also in different industries from retail to banking, but also healthcare. And I am trying to learn in those different podcast series what the metaverse actually is. And yeah, what what is the metaverse in your view? What does it comprise? Or what is the encapsulate? What is it? Yeah, uh, thank you, Samir. So um, with your experience interviewing many metaverse experts, I think I'm going to focus my answer on healthcare. Uh, to me, in short, metaverse is the next level of experience. So as communication and connectivity improves, we tend to have more um, engaging material to interact with. For example, from starting with meeting people in person, then we can move on to phone calls, and then we can even move on to virtual communications. So all of this is about advancement in technology on one hand and in connectivity on the other hand. So metaverse in healthcare is about the next level of experience. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it partially uh, does. So then I, I would see more as some kind of umbrella uh, vision, like the next level of experience. And what, what would that next level experience in healthcare look like? The next level of experience or uh, the, the, love, the, the level of metaverse or extended reality in healthcare basically means that anything that we're doing in real life, we are able to do it in the, the virtual world or the extended reality. It's starting from early career in healthcare. Medical students are able to learn all of their lessons using extended reality in a much more engaging interactive and an active mode of learning rather than the passive mode where they continue to memorize uh, material. Medical education is considered to be very challenging because it requires a high level of interactivity, not just 
when you are in the early years, but all the way when you graduate and you are uh, specializing in anything. So imagine that you are having the entire library and an entire um, dissection room on the tip of your fingers or in your headset or in any um, smart device that you will be having. So this is the level of interactivity or the power that the metaverse or XR can give you. Further on, when we advance in our careers in the healthcare, when we come to specializations, whether it's an orthopedic surgery, whether it's uh, learning how to communicate with patients, today's, in today's time, we're doing all of that in real time. In real time or in real life also means increased risk, increased use of resources, and the constant need of uh, requiring a supervision on top of you. That supervisor must be somebody who's more experienced than you, who is keeping an eye that you're not doing something harmful to the patient because this is a real uh, damage uh, that can happen. Imagine all of that being provided to you in a safe environment. So you're performing surgeries and if you do a mistake, you're completely safe and your patient is completely safe. But your hands are gaining the skills. You're practicing by learning from your own mistakes. Furthermore, when you're communicating with patients, if it's a new uh, mode for you, if it's a new language, you're communicating multiple times, you're repeating your questions multiple times, you're hearing various answers from the patient, and all of this is developing your skills. So now, when you finally are well skilled, skills using XR and you're going to real life experiencing with real patients, you will be much more confident. Um, this part of the answer is only focused on medical uh, practitioners, whether they're nurses or paramedics. And then there is a whole world of opportunities for the patients from patient education, patient awareness, helping them cope with um, painful procedures such as chemotherapy or burns. So it's a whole, uh, a new world in healthcare and basically it's an extended of the world or the reality we are living now. Yeah, that uh, seems super interactive. You also mentioned in your example that the patient uh, gives feedback uh, back to the student. How does that work? Okay. Um, one of the first um, uh, parts that we learn when we begin uh, interacting with patient is history taking. This is what the, the, in the medical terms, history taking, communication with patients, which basically means is the softest skills that you practice with patient. Now, you must have noticed that when you visit a doctor, there is a pattern that they follow in asking you questions. How are you feeling today? Uh, what is the problem? And for how long has it been going on? And it goes all the way back to asking your family history. Is there anyone in your family practicing uh, or in your family experiencing such uh, condition? It goes all the way to asking about your work-related habits. How are you working? Are you sitting very often? So all of this part is part of skills that we train to medical students. It is done in a certain pattern and in many, many uh, ways to make the connection or, or the relationship between the patient and the doctor be more comforting, be more uh, confident, be more uh, trusting to one another. When we replicate all of this inside the metaverse, it means we are basically programming sort of a game. You can imagine any game, like for example, if you are playing a car racing game, um, not necessarily a virtual reality one, but just any game that you're playing or you're playing a fighting game, you do receive a response from the other side as well. There are cars with you who might be uh, bypassing you as well. Why? Because the game has been designed in that way. Well, in today's time, there are so many um, programs, applications, instructional designers working on developing game-based learning, which means you have an entire character in the shape of an instructor or a patient and this character or avatar is very responsive to the communication or the information you are giving them. If you are, for example, inside the XR, you are trying to measure their pulse, you will receive a response. You will know if the pulse is high, normal, or low than, uh, than it should be. 
and based on that you are doing the rest of the activities so it's like a replica it can be as realistic as possible to the real patient that you are having just to confirm is this with uh, virtual reality glasses on or is this with augmented reality that you see this uh, patient um it can be with either and it can be with none so uh, with many applications that are available today, now if we are focusing on, let's say, medical education, there are applications available even on a desktop or a smartphone or a smart tablet mode. So many of the content that um, developers are working on today's time are focusing on making the programs device agnostic, which means we want to be able to be accessible for maximum number of users without the need of or limiting the need of further investment. So you don't necessarily need to invest in a head-mount device. Of course, some applications might definitely need one. But until you don't have one, there can be many applications available on desktop mode or on smart um, devices mode as well. Mm, I see, I see. So I think I have some friends who also uh, pursued a doctor career and they started 18 and then I think one friend of mine is 28 and now he's becoming uh, or starting with some surgery trajectory. So that's quite a long time of studying as mm -hmm. you already outlined. How, how, to what extent do you think this, the implementation of these technologies could shorten uh, the study time span or do you not see that happening? Um, uh, thank you, Samir. That's an interesting question. Um, I think if I can add another question to that, is that sure. are we actually, um, is the objective in medical education to actually shorten the time or not? I think learning in any field is a lifelong process. And if you get the opportunity, even if you're 28, if you're 38 or even older, if you're getting the opportunity to learn new skills, new uh, research in order to uh, make your practice better, then why not? I think the, the, the real challenge that we have is that during the time when doctors or nurses are practicing or even studying, at the same time they're practicing. So it actually goes hand in hand. So um, a specialization or even obtaining another degree does not necessarily mean that you are absent from the clinical practice. So which means in the daytime or in your regular timing, you are continuing to treat patients. But whenever you have the chance, you continue to attend further seminars, conferences, uh, you read books or you attend courses in order to empower your own skills. Why is that? Because there are people who are continuously researching about how to improve the medical practices. And if you don't follow that, then you're actually falling behind. What I actually think, what is the, the objective of this conversation or even the role of XR in this, is that XR can shorten or bridge the gap which is there in unnecessary activities, which means the time to travel or to time to take a break in order to um, attend a course or in, a, in order to attend uh, a workshop or um, uh, let's say a hands-on training. So XR can actually provide you all of the learning material in a limited time availability and easier access anywhere uh, in the world at any time. So if you are at home in the middle of the night and you want to learn something, you don't have to wait until next week and travel to this other city and visit this other specialized simulation center. You can do it right now because you have the entire program in your own um, smart device. So I think this is the power of XR. And in today's time, I'm not just saying this um, hypothetically or imaginary. In today's time, there are surgeons who are practicing remote surgery um, as well. It's just a very recent news about the surgeon being teleported via virtual avatar to NASA space station. So we're no longer talking about planet Earth. We're also talking beyond uh, the planet as well. 
Oh, that's extremely uh, fascinating. And I think this is the education, not only in healthcare, but education as a whole, that you'd like to have like anywhere from any time and not constrained to space and particular schedules of when the university is open or not. So, yeah, it makes uh, sense. Thanks for clarifying that. Pivoting to a kind of different uh, theme, I have had, I think, uh, eight males on my podcast and uh, three females uh, so far so you already see a statistical underrepresentation uh, of women uh, in my podcast alone already but also when i go to technology conferences it's not something unfamiliar that uh, women are underrepresented and i see you giving these talks worldwide at uh, tech events and my question is uh, yeah, how how have you established that uh, position position and yeah, what 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 has your what has been your experience? What have you been encountering in yeah being uh, one of the few females and trying to become a thought leader uh, in that spectrum? Yeah, well, I get to ask um, this question quite often um, about. Uh, being a woman or being a female in, in this field. What I try to do is that um, also additional to, I mean, hearing this question very often, I do hear very different responses every time. But um, I do have my own uh, views on this um, and which I try to share to my juniors or to people who ask me for um, anything or for people who may be looking up to me. I think um, yes, we are discussing gender today, but in the future, we will be only discussing diversity, especially once um, technologies like XR, um, virtual avatars are becoming more and more common. I think the focus here is not only on uh, diversity of gender, but diversity of thought. And diversity of thought is only coming from diversity of various kinds, whether it's racial, uh, gender-related, age-related, background-related, etc. Um, in the community uh, that I'm living in, in the Middle East, or particularly in the GCC, um, contrary to what people might think, uh, it is a very nurturing environment. We do have a lot of focus on the objective and the learning that we're getting from the person, regardless of their background. For anybody who is visiting Dubai or visiting the GCC countries, you will see that in general, the working population is very diverse. We have people from all over the world speaking various languages in all of the um, industries. So I do think that um, I'm privileged enough to have a very diverse and very open um, environment that has also has empowered me um, all the way. I have not faced particular gender discrimination so far. Okay, that's very fortunate to hear and thanks for uh, th th that explanation. But I can also imagine that there, that there are less privileged uh, areas and also uh, for me, for example, I do I'd say I'm in a less privileged area at all, but let's say I want to become uh, a professional football player, but I haven't seen anyone with uh, Moroccan roots uh, who became a professional football player. This is actually a ridiculous example because we have great uh, football players. But then it's I can imagine that it could be uh, more difficult for me to envision a future as to becoming a f football player because I haven't seen as much of these role models that I have seen from other uh, backgrounds. P perhaps you're seeing what I'm getting at. And for the people that are encountering those dimensions and th those environments, what would you say uh, to them perhaps as some instruments that they can pick, pick up on? Okay, um, excellent example about uh, football because um, I'm not a very big uh, football follower, but I do have a, I do actually have a good um, example to share where I, which I'm going to come. So I think whenever you're working on something, um, anywhere in the world, you know, first of all, before you um, get into any task, any project, any job or any learning uh, journey, I think before the world, it's between you and 
basically you, you, your future, your vision, your dreams to achieve that. So I think the first ever thing that one should believe in is to be true to themselves. Believe in your own self. I want to achieve uh, this thing. I want to reach to this level. So I have to believe, first of all, that I am able to achieve that. And then this is how I do it. Um, I don't know if it works for others, but what I try to do is that I imagine the position that I want to reach in and then I work uh, backwards understanding what are the things that I will need to achieve. This is my number one rule. If you are confident in your own self and you are determined that you will be able to reach, then you will see that you will find many examples or even if you don't find an example, probably you are the first one who will set example for others. Whenever I'm trying to achieve something new, um, especially, you know, uh, being a doctor and then having interest in emerging technologies, uh, you are right that I did not have many um, mentors, for example, uh, if, if that's the right word, or people who I can directly uh, take help from or look up to or basically copy their career path. On the other hand, um, when I started the journey, I noticed that my own junior students started to ask me for help. So that's another uh, path. Maybe if you don't have uh, role models to follow or examples to follow, maybe you are setting one. So just believe in yourself that you can do that. I also believe that once you are achieving a level of excellence or a level of achievement in life, then you are actually overshadowing all of the labels that might be attached to you, whether it's a label of a certain gender, a certain race, color, etc., and everything. So the example for this, um, it was very interesting for me to learn about one of the leading and most popular footballers of our times is Mohamed Salah, who's having North African roots. Um, it was a very interesting um, um, a study that I read about using the artificial intelligence uh, for these uh, for the organization or the club to select the players. And the reason Mohamed Salah was selected in, in a particular group was because of artificial intelligence tools analyzing his skills on the playground out of um, hundreds or maybe even thousands of players. So that is the level of brilliance or excellence you want to achieve. I think you have to do your job, learn some of the tricks, learn how the recruitment or learn how the, the future is working and aim towards that. And then you will be setting definitely your own examples as well. Thanks uh, for that answer. And by the way, great uh role model, great football player uh, as well, uh, Mohamed Salah. And um, yeah, I really like the reverse engineering uh, part, like first envisioning and then reverse engineering uh, back from that. Thanks for that uh, and it's really interesting. Foreshadowing uh, the future, seeing what's uh, unfolding uh, in this rapidly developing <coughs> space. What one? Uh, what are you most excited about for the coming? Uh, yeah, let's take three years. And secondly, which new jobs could you see emerge uh, from these new technological developments in healthcare? Um, okay, I'll uh, first. Uh your question about what am I most excited about? So I think I am most excited about um, intelligent uh, connectivity. Intelligent connectivity for me is, or you know how it's going to shape, we keep hearing about uh, 5G and the power of 5G. So intelligent connectivity mainly means the power of high speed and low latency networks, which means you will be able to share information much faster and with lesser uh, obstacles, like we constantly keep complaining that the, the connectivity is low or the signals are not reaching. So all of that is going to be a thing of the past and we will be having the power of intelligent connectivity to help us to reach millions of devices. So I think that on one hand where technology is evolving very um, fastly and very strongly, that is being done. But the actual power of that will be achieved when we will be able to share this powerful tools to billions of people. 
the examples can be really uh, tremendous. Uh, just a few minutes ago, I mentioned to you about uh, remote surgeries using XR. So imagine if we are able to teleport, let's say, one of the most important surgeons in Europe to treat uh, a needing patient in one of the African villages without the need of the, the transportation, without the need of fully equipped uh, surgical room or facility or a fancy setup, but they're able to treat the patient remotely. I mean, just imagine the possibilities. I know sometimes it might be challenging, but intelligent connectivity is one thing that I think is going to be very promising in order to deliver high quality education, high skilled uh, training, uh, quality healthcare uh, to all over the world. To ask a question on the example of teleporting that uh that specialist then how would he do the surgery would that be more verbally like advising some other doctor as to which procedures to take is that the kind of way i should envision it or yes um excellent uh, question samir again first of all most of my uh, uh, most of the answers that i give is basically based on imagining what you imagine today, it will be a reality tomorrow. Even the way we're communicating today, it was an imagination 20 years back to have a, a, a video to video conversation. So it's not very difficult to imagine things. Now, beyond imagination, how this is done, the reality is that there is a major shortage in a skilled workforce, especially in the healthcare industry. Um, according to World Health Organization, by the year 2030, we will be short of 30 million qualified doctors for the field, even in today's time with exponential innovations and technologies, which means that there are very few skilled medical practitioners compared to the need of the entire human population. That's why you often hear in major hospitals, they often announce that a certain surgeon is traveling, let's say from US to Europe for a number of days. And in these number of days, they will be performing uh, a certain type of surgery. Why? Because this doctor is the only person who's qualified enough to do the surgery. Now imagine if this one doctor is spending 12 to 14 hours only sitting in the airplane. How much valuable time is being uh, wasted or simply gone without actually uh, working? Now the same doctor, how it can help in XR is that mainly they can guide virtually without the need of being traveling. Not just guide virtually over uh, verbal communication, but the doctor who is in another continent using XR tools like smart glasses or virtual reality glasses, they can oversee the surgery as it is happening. So unfortunately, if there is any mistake can happen, the surgeon can see it in real time and give his feedback accordingly. That you did this thing wrong, correct it in this manner. And on the other hand, in the actual uh, medical facility, you will be having probably less skilled uh, practitioners who understand uh, the language, who understand the devices, the instruments that are being used and are able to copy and uh, the information. So by this, you are able, that one surgeon will be able to reach many, many patients around the world. And more than reaching the patient, it's about the transfer of the skills, the transfer of knowledge, and being able to connect with more and more people.